one of the inspiring principles of the International Psychoanalytical uh, Studies Organization is teamwork, to create connections and encourage a lively discussion on the human being. So we are convinced that this network represents the basis for the development of a free and transformative thinking. And this event that's made of dialogues, stories, and images contains this authentic spirit. We find ourselves between uh, India and the UK. And uh, we are going to follow an engaging and interesting conversation on the creative process in visual art, as well as in psychoanalysis. I will now uh, introduce you um, uh, Anish Kapoor. So uh, thank you uh, again, uh, Anish, for your very uh, great generosity, for your presence, for um, being here uh, in this uh, wonderful event. Thank you. Um, so you were born uh, in uh, 1954 in Mumbai, and you are uh, internationally uh, recognized as one of today's uh, leading uh, contemporary artists. You were incre increasingly uh, renowned for your artworks that blur the boundary uh, between architecture and uh, sculpture. And many of your public works um, have become iconic landmarks. And uh, you live and work in London, UK. Thank you. A leading figure in the fields of cultural psychology and the psychology of religion, as well as a novelist, Dr. Kakkar's person and work have been profiled in the New York Times, Le Monde, Lobs, which listed him as one of the world's 25 major thinkers in the world. His, his writings come to reflect the complex intrapsychic struggles and interpersonal relational strivings of several transitional identities in search of self-affirmation. They raise critical, conceptual, clinical, and methodological issues spanning over a time period of more than three decades. His works embody a consistent attempt to relativize the theory and practice of psychoanalysis within the Indian context. It's my pleasure that you have decided to join this event. Well, Ashish, I'm so honored and glad that we can finally meet on the screen, at least. Uh, it has been a long time. And uh, I think so, so many people here would be interested who probably know or maybe not that much that you have had a very long association with psychoanalysis. You've been in psychoanalysis for many, many years. And I wonder if you could tell us something about that, elaborate on that a bit. And after that, then I have that question of, because you once, uh, once you said, I think in an interview, that I feel somehow that psychoanalytic process and the process that we go through as artists in the studio are very closely related. But I would love it if you could start with the personal part of your analytic journey, journeys, and how was that? Mm. Yes, Sudhir, uh, what a pleasure to talk to you and to share this space with you all. One doesn't go initially, at least, to uh, psychoanalysis um, um, for the story, for fun, for the adventure. One goes out of desperate need. And um, in the early 70s, when I left India, I left India under uh, let's say, at least for me, cloudy, confused skies in which I did not really understand deep in myself what was there. My parents, my mother's Jewish Iraqi, my father uh, was a, a, a Hindu but not a practicing one, from, from um, Rao Pindi, uh, which is now Pakistan, um, and we were brought up in a cosmopolitan uh, milieu, let's say. Uh, India 
if you like, just after independence, looking for its own sense of what it means to be a nation. Who is an Indian and who is not an Indian? How does a Jew fit into being an Indian? And so on, so forth. Um, things that sat with me with considerable pain and difficulty. Um, let me tell you a little story. So I was, my brother and I went to Israel in 1973. Um, I was in a oh, pain, painful state. And I had, I had this aunt who lived in Tel Aviv. Um, I was on a kibbutz and my aunt had a kind of, um, how can one put it, shamanistic predilection. You'll like this, Sudhir, you'll like this. Um, and my mother, my mo she, she, you know, I was not very happy or very well, frankly. And my mother came over um, to see me, see my brother and I in Israel. And she cons consulted my aunt, what shall we do? What shall we do? Oh, my poor son is going through a terrible time. And my aunt said, you know what? You must go back to India and you must collect some earth from a place where Anish was. I mean, this moves me to almost to tears. So I say it with due respect for the situation and for her. You must go to India and bring some earth and then you must spread it under Anish's bed. He will dream himself well through his maternal earth. Difficult, but real. It is for me and has been for me, of course, since then, the first ritual material. That's what artists work with, ritual materials. Now, psychoanalytically speaking, of course, <laughs> after years and years of this process, um, I entered into a kind of mytho-psychoanalytical um, process to grapple with what it means to be in between, to be in between being Indian, being Jewish, being well, a bloody artist. What does it mean to be an artist? What is an artist? Um, and, and what are, if you like, the psychic materials with which we work? I have taken from psychoanalysis, I took psychoanalysis, I take psychoanalysis terribly seriously. I believe it is the only, uh, if you like, tool for um, our endeavor to unveil our complex inner lives um, at so many levels. Um, but I take it literally. So you lie on the couch, you speak to your analyst, and what comes up, comes up. It comes up, and amazingly, the next session it comes up again, and amazingly, the next session it comes up again, and then it's formulated, if you like, into a kind of, a kind of narrative which relates to some inner truth. It takes a while, but there it is. It forms the beginnings of. Now, I believe the same process happens in the studio. I have said 10,000 times or more than that, I have nothing to say as an artist. I have nothing to say. My job is to do what I don't know, to go where I can't go, to be what I can't be. Um, so, in the studio, you go and do something. I don't care what. I'm forever telling you. I have a few people who work with me in the studio uh, because sculpture is a long process. I'm forever telling them, don't think, do. Don't think, do. I used to have it written on my studio wall. You know, I had two things written there. One is, don't think, do. And the other is, I will never be a worker in my own factory. So, no business. It's not about business. It's about 
psychic discovery. If it isn't about that, it's about nothing. And I give up. Um, so do, 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 do. And out of doing amazingly, just like in psychoanalysis, the same things occur and reoccur and reoccur. They are, I use the word I'm about to use advisedly, they are the alchemical, alchemical, I mean alchemical, um, um, uh, materials of work, of transformation, of, of, um, um, of, of process. I mean, may I, may I just a, a, little, a little funny thing? You know, I don't know if, I'm sure all of you have seen Mel Brooks's film, Blazing Saddles. Mm -hmm. Great kind of spoof cowboy film. Mel Brooks is a genius. But anyway, in it, Madeline Kahn sings this amazing song in which she says, I am so tired of being admired. I, if, I, if I could sing, I would sing it for you. Anyway, I'm so tired of being admired. Now, when people ask you about being an artist, they always say, what inspires you? My response is, I'm so tired of being inspired. Because in fact, it is the smallest part, as my little daughter says, a teeny <laughs> part of the reality. Um, the reality is that making art is like making prayers. It is a constant, constant, constant process of, of um, reinvestment of the self. Out of it comes what must come. Inspiration is back. <laughs> Sorry, Sadira, a very long answer to your very elegant no, question. No, 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 no. Uh, let me, uh, I picked up two things from what you just said and would like your responses. One is, of course, your, the recurring things in psychoanalysis, which comes up. It is like a kaleidoscope of shattered glass, which, uh, which same pieces, but uh, every time they make a very new thing too. So I think you experience that in psychoanalysis also as a, as a kaleidoscope. The elements, the shattered pieces are the same, the recurring ones. And the second one was the pain which you said, which, uh, which many artists, poets have said. I think uh, one of the best quotes I have is by, oddly enough, by Jung, C.G. Jung, uh, uh, who also, uh, in his time of pain, painted a lot. So Jung says, to the extent that I managed to translate the emotions into images, that is to say, to find the images that were concealed in the emotions, I was inwardly calmed and reassured. Had I left those images hidden in the emotions, I might have been torn to pieces by them. As a result of my experiment, I learned how helpful it can be from the therapeutic point of view to find the particular images which lie behind emotions. Uh, we, we have others also, I mean, the German poet Heine, that disease may well have been the ground in full for that creative urge. Creation was my body's purge, creating our grown sane and sound. Rilke, my work is really nothing but a self-treatment. Uh, how would you relate to relate to those which mm. I mean there are many who have said that or, or repeated the same um, sentiments. So they I think uh, problematic may I say. Yeah, exactly. Problematic because one does not want to think of the creative process as um, um, how can one put it self-healing. Um, yeah. It may well be self-healing but that is not what it's about. The poetic object um, has its own, if you like, rules, conditions, premises, et cetera, et cetera. Rilke mm -hmm. may well have uh, 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 drawn this out in himself, but I don't for one second, I'm afraid, believe that... Um, 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 it was the real deep purpose. I'm thinking of something. 
You know, in 19, oh my God, oh, forgive me if I get this wrong. It could be 1934. Um, Picasso did a huge and wonderful show at the Kunsthalle in Zurich. And as it happens, Jung, since you mentioned Jung, mm -hmm. Jung wrote a review of it in which he said, Picasso, wah, Picasso, <laughs> Picasso. <laughs> this is the rantings and ravings of a schizophrenic. Now, um, sorry, I'm forgetting his name. The, 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 the writer of his, of his great biography. Ah, oh, John Richardson's, my wife Sophie shouting across the room to me. Um, um, John Richardson, in his incredible, insightful biography of Picasso says, no, no, Mr. Jung, you got this wrong. It is not the question here of the condition of mind. The artist is not just a poet, but he is a shamanistic, and I say nothing less, shamanistic mm. figure who enters a psychic space in order to reveal, to open the possibility of trauma. And I mm -hmm. think this is a seriously important um, mm -hmm. issue. Um, which Picasso in his best years, <laughs> the 30s, mid 30s being in my view, his best years, um, once he'd done with all of the, 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 the stuff of cubism and all the crap, you know, whatever, but got to the, 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 if you like, the deep issue of mythological issues of the feminine, of, of aggression and all that stuff. When Picasso was there in those problematic pre-war pre years, um, Shamanistic, no less. This sense of opening the spirit. If an artist can do that, I, you know, Sudhir, you know about this stuff, of course, you've written many a book about it. Um, but what I, what I think I'm trying to say here is, um, actually, I'm going to quote a little bit here from my dear, dear Julia Kristeva, one, one of your colleagues and uh, um, a truly, a truly, uh, you know, someone who follows, who I follow and who, with whom I'm an old friend. Um, but she says, is it, is it still possible to paint when the bonds that tie us to the body and meaning are severed? Is it still possible to paint when desire, which is a bond, disintegrates? Is it still possible to paint when identifies not with desire, but with severance, which is the truth of human psychic life. In the next sentence or two, somewhere down, 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 further down the paragraph, she says, painting is of course a substitute for prayer. And it's a point I was trying to make earlier on, that it is the repeated action, the, you know, Buddhistically speaking, if you like, to go back, to go back, to go back, to go back, again and again and again. Reveals, repetition reveals what, what the psyche hides. And I think that is something that slowly emerges even before I know it. Isn't that the most marvelous thing of all, really? I don't know it's there and it's there. Um, you'll forgive me for going on one more and I will shut up. But go ahead, go ahead, absolutely. It is precisely in this problematic area that beauty lies, it seems to me. Beauty's here, you know, it's right here, right now, always. It's never gone. Our job is to realize that. And it is, if you like, one of those subtle, subtle forces that emerges. Um, um, Julia, Julia Kristeva projects the possibility that the abject, that that which disgusts us, that which is um, beyond, if you like, um, consumption, 
beyond a simulation is, is transcendent and has the beautiful in it. Of course, that's where we are in contemporary terms. Um, let's say postmodernism comes to that point to say the blah of life is actually what is most interesting and what is most poetic and what is most engaging. Um, can we go there, but without the will being involved? As a last phrase on this, again, Buddhistically speaking, there's a wonderful Buddhist phrase which says, all intention misses the mark. Just think about that for a bit. All intention misses the mark. So it's the unwanted consequences of intention that is our, if you like, alchemical material. <laughs> Forgive me, dear. No, no, no. There's nothing. I mean, I, I mean, I quite agree with you. I think psychoanalysis uh, has placed uh, too much uh, emphasis on the therapeutic part of the artistic, uh, the, the self-healing, the self-therapeutic. And that is one, thing. That is the, one of the big intentions the, which you're talking of. Uh, it, it, but it is still would be, I wouldn't completely dismiss it. I would say that is a secondary, in fact, secondary in fact, Agreed. the textbook of Sanskrit poetics, uh, when they're talking about poetics, why do poets write poetry? Uh, it says that escape from ills as a secondary, of the, so not as the primary. And I think we might be mistaken in psychoanalysis as thinking that is the primary part of it. So I agree, 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 agree with you that. Uh, well, <clears throat> Why do you think that so many artists uh, are so scared of psychoanalysis uh, who <laughs> feel that they would like to keep whatever it is, it would completely kill their creativity? It's a weird fiction, isn't it? I must say, I have never fully understood it. And I have many artist colleagues who say psychoanalysis, oh, no, not me. Um, almost yeah. as if... Um, um, uh, there's a kind of fear that what it might do is to reveal um, the true or, or some deeper, deeper um, reason for, 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 for being an artist in the first place. Uh, sorry, I don't get it. I literally don't get it. It's as if, um, um, it's as if, it's it's a well it's a mistaken um, and it's not just artists I you know a lot of people are afraid of psychoanalysis it's as if looking into yourself is uh, the one thing that um, 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 bigger social questions don't allow um, capitalism mm -hmm. if, if I may be so bold capitalism promotes the idea that we can um, 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 foster foster desire with never, never, ever, ever looking at why and what its, what its deeper, deeper reasons may be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to also have your views or talk a little about something which has always been, I think for every culture or at least Western culture very much so, uh, of the extraordinary artistic creativity. Now we know when a child begins to paint, she shows her artwork to teachers, parents, and relatives who recognize it as creative. Then she may be said to have a mini C level of creativity as so many children and some adults do. The girl grows up, pursues art as a career. She develops her craft, acquires a level of professional expertise, sells her paintings, many or few. And the woman now has pro C or professional level of creativity. But what I think interests so many people, though is the big C or the third level of creativity, mm. that of artistic genius. Mm. At this level of creativity, the artist's work is not only remembered, discussed and analyzed for many years to come, but is acknowledged as exceptional and revolutionary. And mm. since you are recognized, uh, rightly so in my opinion, to belong to that level, there is no one better to, to look at that uh, 
uh, although the mystery of ultimate mystery of like, extraordinary creativity there are so many people who say that it is not possible to come to that at all uh, mm -hmm. you were talking about the shamanic ones but uh, and there is a whole from immanuel kant that uh, the author of a product for which he is indebted to his genius does not himself know how he has come mm -hmm. by his ideas and he has not the power to communicate to others in precepts that will enable them to produce similar products and we of course know freud also agreed to that when it comes the artist ability to create is not a question of psychology but this does not stop did not stop freud or so many other analysts are still on speculating on what is the roots of this extraordinary artistic creativity and we know the western notions of genius influence yes. of plato and aristotle yes. they linked it to an extreme mental state you know, the madness in plato's poet was because of gods taking over his personality speaking through him while the melancholy of the genius from aristotle onwards was attributed to the excess of black bile bodily humor and indeed in european middle ages as you well know elbridge durer's well known portrait of a man sunk in melancholic thought as the quintessential representation of the artist became really the defining attribute of the creative person uh, i think psychoanalysis has gone not too much beyond it it doesn't it has no longer looked that as looks of melancholy or as a static thing but it is still very much uh, of uh, uh, that uh, there is uh, he provides haven from storms maturity uh, and that it uh, something i i still don't know whether we can come to come to ever to this uh, mystery of course there are philosophers like medover who says that's a romantic notion that extraordinary artistic creativity has a mystery that's a romantic notion we'll we'll soon know it uh, and of course at the moment uh, the extraordinary creativity is no longer mm. or mm. is mm. a province of uh, emotions and uh, inner conflicts oh. and uh, and the attempts mm. to mm. to uh, of mm. self feeling or more than that but very much uh, a kind of a processes of the brain uh, of the cognitive and perceptual processes are very different uh, is is creativity started being viewed fundamentally as biological and that's synthesia that blending of senses is said to be seven and eight times more in artists than in rest of the population and what synthesia does is of course increase the skill at forming metaphors and we have the neuroscientist ramchandran who suggests that there may be a gene which if it expressed in one part of the brain results in lower synesthesia if expressed in another part results in higher synesthesia and if expressed all over the brain you get the potential artist also evidence that artists can shift between brain hemisphere more fluidly than non artist and that creativity may be enhanced when this interhemispheric flexibility is maximized now this is from the brain side then you have the in the psychoanalytic from the play side that the artists are very near in this playful leela as one would call it uh, mm -hmm. uh, where the availability where play and creativity much more is there mm -hmm. uh, you have also of course we were talking of the melancholy and loss which is one of the more in psychoanalytic uh, at the moment that uh, uh, as one of the primary of uh, creativity of the artistic creativity but all of them somehow uh, uh, do not convince uh, is it all of them together is it uh, and of course the, but what i've also found in contemporary psychoanalysis is where the whole sexuality has gone away i mean it is much more loss and it's uh, gone away and uh, and sexuality not in the sense of sublimation but of the libido released through sexual activity spilling into and fueling artistic creativity mm -hmm. uh, let me quote freud here because what forgets it 
Uh, he said the relationship between the amount of sublimation possible and the amount of sexual activity necessary naturally varies very much from person to person and even from one calling to another. An abstinent artist is hardly conceivable, but an abstinent young savant is certainly no rarity. The latter can by his self-restraint liberate forces for his studies, while the former, the artist, probably finds his artistic achievements powerfully stimulated by sexual activity. Uh, so all these various, uh, which I think uh, would be wonderful where you are adding the shamanic part there too, of, to explain the extraordinary artistic creativity. I wonder if you would have any more thoughts to those. Thanks. Sure. What a sense. question and a half. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, um, where to start? I mean, there are so many different places to go with this. Um, one thing one might speculate on for a little bit just uh, is that science has on the whole been very good at explaining much of our, of our um, um, makeup our predilections, our physical realities. Um, on consciousness, however, this strange, weird thing about which you've written a great deal, Sadir, um, um, this strange thing, you know, where was I before I was born? Where do I go after I die? Those questions remain unanswered and what is it that makes consciousness? You know, is it, as the Buddha suggests, if you take a cart, it's not a cart, it's a pair of wheels, it's a transverse axis, it's a box on top. It's only when you put them together that there's a cart, i.e. consciousness, he infers, this I thing is an amalgam of possibilities. Um, a beautiful, I think, um, 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 analogy of, of um, what it makes, what it takes to give um, um, this thing we call consciousness. I want next, in a way, I've just written a few notes from what you were saying, but I want next, in a way, to you know, what that does, what that says is that we have this incredible ability to have a big spirit, to be conscious, if you like, in the wide, and I'm stretching my arms, uh, in the wide sphere. What we do to our people, however, is criminal. If we think of the way we educate our children to be, you know, factory fodder for our economic machine, it drives me crazy. I really hate it. I find this just appalling. What we do is reduce the human spirit to some stupid man of mathematical formula, some spelling, some idiotic crap that they teach in schools. I find it offensive. And um, we, we, if you like, uh, we in, in, in the, uh, the, the psychoanalytical psychic community have not been able, have failed to communicate um, um, the the, the, the spirit of, of largeness, of bigness, of openness that we are, that we potentially are. Mm -hmm. The artist is, without a doubt, a fool, an absolute fool. That may be an old romantic idea, Sudhir. Again, I know you've written a great deal about this. Um, but in that process of foolish, I'm going to have a go at this, and then I'm going to have a go at that, whatever, foolish endeavor. Something happens, something which is not me, something else occurs. You call it, uh, you just use the word Leela, Leela, Indian word for, um, if you like, um, it's not just play, it's play uh, um, that goes into, sorry? Yeah, yeah, divine play. What, what did you say, sir? Uh, no, divine play. Divine play. 
play that has transcendent, play that yeah. has transcendent um, mm -hmm. um, um, possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what was Ramakrishna? Rama, you've, again, you've written about Ramakrishna, I know. Or, or Osho, Osho, um, you know, the sex guru. You've written about mm -hmm. both of them. Um, what were they, if not fools? Fools willing to risk, risk belief to the level at which um, they um, 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 put their own being, uh, Ramakrishna for sure, Osho less clear, um, but put their own being at deep risk in the service of, in Ramakrishna's case, Mother Kali. You know, what mm -hmm. happened there? What was, is that deep psychic journey mm -hmm. um, that allows such, such risk? Now, my suggestion is that the artist does something very similar. Um, um, mm -hmm. in, in this curious, let me give you a really straightforward example. I made a work um, uh, years ago called um, Shooting into the Corner. I don't know if, if, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. Monica, could you put a picture of, of it up if it's possible? So, um, shooting into the corner. I was invited to do a sh an exhibition at uh, uh, a museum in Vienna. And Vienna um, in the 60s and early 70s had a group of artists, um, um, Hermann Nietzsche, uh, 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 Gunter Bruce and a few others who, you know, worked with the body and blood and performance and so on. So I thought, what the hell, I've got to have a go. So I put a cannon at one end of the room and shot some wax pellets. I just had this daft idea. I'm going to shoot wax pellets into the corner. I promise you, I had no idea what I was doing other than being a naughty boy. Um, and I, the moment I made the work, I realized something acute. First of all, the most obvious thing, this is, uh, if you like, a sexual psychodrama happening. He's, he's shooting at her. How fast is it that the, the, the corner, if you like, the beginning of architecture, the original moment becomes feminine. How is it? And it happens like this. And then what do I know? There's Goya's, the death of the innocents. There's Jackson Pollock throwing paint at the canvas. There's a whole series of, um, if you like, um, a, a, a recall to blood and, and, and um, um, ritual to, to, to male and female, to all sorts of things. Where the hell did they come from? And they are there like that. I don't have to interpret it. It's there. So mm -hmm. um, in this kind of crazy bravado, something occurs. You know, um, um, if I may, I'm going to um, um, talk about another work, which is, a, a, work, a work called Descent into Limbo. Um, can I ask Monica once again, please? So Descent into Limbo is a room. Originally it was made, um, I forget when, uh, 19, early uh, 1990 or something like that. Um, um, a room with a deep, dark, black hole in it. So again, you know, I thought to myself, I've made a few works around this area, I thought to myself, Oh God, can I risk it? Do I dare risk it? I'm going to do it. So I make a room with a hole in it that is truly dark, truly dark. The first time I showed it, um, you know, you make a room like this, you close the door. What happens is in these art shows, you know, there's a line outside the door, a big long line. You have to wait 45 minutes to go into the room. A man came waited his 45 minutes, came into the room, stood there and said, oh, quelle horreur. Why do I have to stand in line for 45 minutes to look at a black carpet? Mm -hmm. Now, for me, this is already total success because it's a space 
that looks like a hole in a picture, but actually isn't a hole. It is a hole, but isn't a hole. It's a space full of darkness, a space full of, full of interiority. Um, it mm -hmm. reads literally like a black carpet on the floor. You, it, there is, it's not, it's a non-object, a non-object object, a thing which is not a thing. Um, so this man was so furious, he took his glasses off and threw them at it. Um, and, and of course they went down the hole. And he went, oh, I can't, this is ridiculous, I can't bear it. And he, you know, hugged the walls to say, my God, this is terrifying. So what am I after? What am I after? I'm after just that, obviously. I'm after exactly that. This sense, this, that the Kantian sublime, the sublime that Kant talks about, isn't an aesthetic proposition. It's an internal proposition. And what is the internal proposition? It's full of fear. It's full of that, that um, um, reaching into oneself, which is, which is terrifying. I'm going to suggest that it's that part of the creative so-called moment. So it's one thing for our protagonist, for her to paint a picture, but it's another thing when in so doing, she reaches or touches a small stroke, a little moment or a big stroke or whatever it is, in herself that goes, <clears throat> what, did I do that? What can it be? It says, there we have the beginning. There we mm. have the beginning of the, 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 the true deep fear that is something that we all share. The void, you know, when I, this isn't me, not enough, doesn't describe me, as we all know, since we're all psychoanalysts, since you're all psychoanalysts. Um, when I close my eyes, there's a darkness, there's a space, there's an interiority. Even that doesn't encompass me. But when I see that as a physical thing, what I tend to do is to fill it up with content. I bring, I, the viewer, brings the content. I bring the possibility of meaning. And I think that's the last part of my argument here, which is that the artist has to get out of the way. Bugger mm -hmm. off artist, go away. We're not interested yeah. in you. What we're interested in is what you may leave behind for the, for the viewer to deeply participate in. And in order for that to happen, there has to be, if you like, an extra ego outside of the ego um, mm -hmm. um, dimension yeah. to, to, to the making, to the thinking, to the writing, to the poetic act. And I, I suspect that in that somewhere is this, this um, uh, true deep creative Whatever, whatever we, we, might, we might call it. Because it's in the conversation that I can have. I recognize that. I know what's going on because I see it in the work and it says, it is me. Mm -hmm. Somewhere there. Something there. We notes two things. One is this, this inner darkness which you're talking of. Uh, you, you also have it in other, on the walls, also squares I've seen of the, the dark. Uh, and this whirlpool, which I saw in Kochi, which, without a bottom, also has a similar Descent kind of limbo. feeling. So. No, it's uh, what's it called? Uh, dissension. So, it's called dissension. Monica, maybe you can get an image of it up now. Yeah. 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 And yeah. So, yeah. So, so this yeah. seems to me to be one of your cladiscopes, uh, pieces of glass, which are going to different different ones uh, but but, uh, but I also remember Anish I saw at the house of Kunst uh, a big circle of the most exquisite or blinding yellow which 
it it was mm-hmm. the opposite of darkness completely mm-hmm. opposite of darkness and mm-hmm. if you remember i was so impressed by it uh, that uh, i asked you that if i could have it on the cover of my book on spiritual mad and divine so exactly so it is not only the only the inside the darkness there is that of that blinding yellow sunlight too a possibility i'm living in goa i can't see your work mm-hmm. as much as i would love to but i do remember that like that sun which was an more than a sun <laughs> an inside sun it was very much an inner sun there uh, and the second thing uh, which struck me there was what you were talking about the artist uh, get out of the way uh, it, it uh, uh, you you very well know but uh, th- there are there are some cu- cultural differences on how the artist is also perceived uh, you know, uh, in the and i'm sure you 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 are very much that because the in uh, 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 because the artist as described in the older text is he is not a flawed being prone to madness or melancholia not for the indian artist the sensual excesses that europeans have almost come to ex- expect of their creative artists mm. so the in the shilp shastra the, they describe the indian artist the painter must be a good man no sluggard nor given to anger holy learned self controlled devout and charitable and especially not an adulterer but uh, the striving for individuality in the artist what we would uh, psychoanalysis would call a healthy narcissism were suspicious so to be truly creative it was necessary for the individual personality traits and complexes to be transcended Mm. so the indian artist though a person is not a personality mm. the personality traits and complexes were believed to be transitory and accidental veiling the fount of creativity what they called pratibha the creative imagination so which, which is a you 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 seem to mention something like that of the artist as a person not disappearing but at least taking very much a back seat um severe as a first reaction to the second part yeah. of that um right it seems to me from where i stand anyway that this thing the hand of the artist is overrated yeah that the hand of art, the artist is only the tool another tool like the color red or whatever else just it's a tool by which to through which to get to something else i think history shows that the hand of the artist becomes irrelevant um and that that the artists in which there is too much hand also become irrelevant it's mm-hmm. a it's a weird thing now um one has to tie this into a very very complicated contemporary um i i hear you about the historic indian artist you know be be a nice citizen be a good boy or girl right. do do it as you're supposed to do it because moral and psychic correctness gives birth to um to the to to if you like the the sacred image and i think that word is really important the sacred image mm-hmm. oh i tire at that revisionist it seems to me revisionist um hindu um 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 uh, uh image it seems to me that um um uh, rene gerard you know who i mean of course the 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 uh um french anthropologist um, is right you know with uh, bataille and baudrillard and so on that 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 at the heart of the sacred there is deep violence um and that indian in i say revisionist because i think i mean it um um neo hindu uh, visions of course put the violence as if they say oh go away put it away you know we don't but of course we know that it sits there looming at us pointing at us um in a way 
demanding our, our attention. So um, at our peril, I say, psychically, do we put violence aside? Do we put misdemeanor aside? Do we put, um, do we put if you like, social education up, up front? I mean, I've had my rant about the education of our children, um, but, but it, it runs so deep in us, the socialized being, which is perhaps why um, the artist um, um, has at least seen themselves. We have seen ourselves either as the fool or the outsider or as the, or the drunk, the, 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 at least within a, we a Western tradition. Um, the balance between the two somewhere, there's something between the two, between um, don't listen, disobey, disagree, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the ever present, unbelievably powerful recall mm. of tradition. We cannot get away from it. We just cannot. Um, it doesn't matter what you do as a, a as a, as a as a painter or a sculptor, you have to deal with what was done before. It will appear like this, um, mm -hmm. and you know we have to we keep going back to it. Um, in terms of the so-called spiritual, if I could go to the first part of your question, uh, in a way, um, you know, darkness is for me, an abiding, the void, the empty object, the, the, the thing beyond words, the thing that's un, unspoken, um, is an abiding condition. It's, I seem to have discovered in myself the possibility that all objects, and this may be very Indian, but that all objects have an on, a non-object self. And my mission as an artist, whether I'm making mirror works or void works or paintings or whatever else, my mission seems to be recurringly to bump into this idea of the non-object self that's somewhere in the object it's, uh, as, a, as a thing. Um, and uh, um, so I take that, I, I discovered it, rather I came across it in the work. I didn't think it, I came across it in the work took it seriously and keep returning to it. It keeps, it's always there with me. Um, the idea of, of um, esoteric transcendent color, of course, is um, um, a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, one could go from, I don't know, Hildegard uh, Bingen to, to um, oh God knows, all over the place. There's so much to say about it. Um, mm. Rothko and Barnett Newman being, if you like, the modernist um, 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 incarnations of color as, as a transcendent um, process. Um, I've worked with color as physical stuff. So, I mean, uh, Monica, I don't know if you, if you care to, but you know, some of those early pigment pieces, um, um, so, you know, where it is physical matter on the ground, uh, on the wall, coming, coming out of the wall, doing whatever, physical stuff. But the weird mm -hmm. thing about color is that even when it is physical, you can't just look at it as physical. It always has a kind of other, an otherness that won't allow singular reading. Um, um, it's a weird thing about color. So you, you were mentioning this big work, which you used, uh, I mean, thank you, um, um, on the cover of your book. I'm honored to be, to be part of it, um, but the work called Yellow. Um, the idea of a field yeah. of color, a field of color big enough to encompass your whole view. And then um, mm -hmm. uh, formally, I mean, from a formal uh, structural point of view, doing something which, um, of course, I'm a sculptor, so I'm interested mainly uh, a lot in concavity. Concavity is a very strange um, physical phenomenon. It has a focus. 
It doesn't matter whether it's mirrored, dark, colored, whatever. It has a focus. It's a physical thing. Um, and as you pass that almost mystical point in space here somewhere, where the, where the lines of light cross or the lines of sound cross as well, um, something happens. In a mirrored work, it'll turn the world upside down. Um, you know, you know in, in, it, it, it's a focus for sound, it's a focus for sight. It is a weird phenomenon. Um, mm. And I've worked with it a great deal. So this big yellow piece you're talking about called yellow, which I don't know that we have an image of um, here. Um, mm. I, I wish it was. also <laughs> has this focus. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, tra a traditional Indian artist, you know, who make those Nathdwara paintings, etc. Mm -hmm. So among them, so they recognize the masters. Mm -hmm. And so of, of their view of what it is, isn't, of what it is. So they, they call it uh, creativity. They call it, it's all Maya Rupa. Uh, Maya, not in the sense of illusion, that is a later meaning of Maya, but uh, earlier Maya was the creative energy of God, etc. So, mm. so all the forms which I have inside me is thrown into my art. This is the sacred truth. I'm quoting him. All imagination and things of worldly appearance and form exist there first. They are not real when they come outside. These appearances in art are confused thinking, fantasies, and like the dream world. And this reminded me of uh, some, some way you also said art as fiction. Mm. Could you, because this seemed to connect with, with what this person was also saying, although it comes from a completely different worldview, different socialization, but art as a, a fiction that, that all outside forms are really coming from inside. There's a Jung also sentence of who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. I mean, it's very, very, you know, um, Sadir, if you'll forgive me, a small uh, divergence, which is a very difficult thing. In, um, let's say that, that colonialism, but in, in, if you like, our colonial experience, we were given to understand, I say we as, you know, uh, if you like, once colonial, so to speak, subjects, um, were given to understand that there was cultural hierarchy, that there was, um, um, oh, you know, the Britishers, as we used to call them, um, had, if you like, a certain kind of superiority. The weird thing that we've done to ourselves, of course, in the last um, 70 whatever years it is since our independence, is that we have remodeled that in our own name. That is to say, we have Sanskritic culture, so-called high culture, and all the regional stuff. India was never one country. It was never um, high, in that sense, high and low. It was always a set of regional um, 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 inquiries, shall I say, regional realities that lived alongside each other. Um, so when you mention the uh, Nathkwar uh, 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 painting, um, you're talking about a very specific kind of, um, 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 a specific tradition, and we confuse that with the lack of originality. It is not so. Exactly. It is mm -hmm. not so. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. Every traditional form in that sense has its own, um, 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 oh, how can one put it, has its own um, um, spectrum and it reaches wide, a very wide spectrum of, of possibility, um, creative possibility I'm talking about. So, so the, the creator is no slave to what was, what was done before, in other words. Um, um, there's a battle to fight here, a difficult battle, I think, I think, about um, how the great heroes, if you like, of, um, 
um, our modern museums of our modern, of, of, if you like, what is called the contemporary are all white and all male. And there's a hierarchy that says, these are the greats and everything else comes after. In fact, it's not so. I don't believe it for one second. It's another neo-colonialist view, it seems to me. Um, you know, almost certainly the great artists of our time are female and not from, from a Western tradition. Um, so we have to open this up in ourselves and so on. Okay, I'm sorry, this is uh, not, not truly answering your question, which I have now forgotten. What was your question, my dear? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, the, 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 no, not the question. I was just uh, pointing out a, a similarity of a... Uh, from this yes. traditional painter who's regarded as a master yes. there. I mean, he has high artistic yes. creativity. Yes. Saying that Indeed. All, all art is, is fantasy, is fiction. I, and re relating oh. to your oh. of, of saying art is fiction, yes. which was, yes. he was saying exactly the same kind of a thing, that it's, it's yes. only inside the forms, uh, which, and when you're trying to put, when you're putting them outside, they become completely uh, fantasies, dreams, etc. Not to be... I mean, it may well be true, and we see it in our real everyday lives increasingly, especially in these weird times, um, that our inner uh, fictional realities are more real than, 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 than the so-called real. Um, and it may well be that um, in art, um, um, deeper truth is hidden in what's unreal, than mm -hmm. in what is so apparently, mm -hmm. what is apparently real. Um, it's a curious, it's a curious fact, I think, that, um, um, you know, for, I'll give you a very, very simple example. I have a great colleague, a great colleague, truly great colleague, um, called Richard Serra. Richard Serra is an artist who makes things, great big things out of steel. Um, and they are, you know, bendy sheets of steel and great, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, 100 tons of mass. Um, Richard has often said that it's the weight and the volume that does the work. And I've taken issue with him mm -hmm. in one particular way. I say, Richard, yes, you're right. It's the weight and volume that does the work, but... The skin of the object, the skin, that infinitesimal um, fraction of a millimeter that is the outer cover of the, ob of, of the object does more work. It is the thing to, through which we read the object. So its weight, weirdly, is given by mass, form, size, etc., and the skin. And that is, this, it's, a, it's a strange thing. So a big piece of steel with drips all over it tells you something about liquid, tells you something about heat, tells you something about process. It says something about the earth and where you begin to, so all sorts of things emerge that one mm -hmm. might say are not fully real, or at least, the argument might be that they are not fully to do with the physical stuff. They are all projected just as, you know, in a, in a void work of mine, for example, um, I've discovered that emptying out is not emptying out. Emptying out is filling up. It's suddenly full of stuff. Where the hell did it come from? And it inevitably comes from my fictional inner mm -hmm. reality or in a continuum or whatever the hell one calls it. Um, so this, this give and take between real and unreal, between what's fiction, what's not fiction, what's truth, what's, yeah, I'm not gonna go there too much because of, because of the horrors of the contemporary discussion about truth, but, but, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for uh, this fantastic discussion. Uh, both um, Anish and Sudhir. Uh, I would like to, to ask myself a first question, if I may so. 
Um, previously, uh, Anish, you were talking about the Kamenistic uh, figure uh, uh, of the artist being a Kamenistic figure, like a sort of revealing uh, something of the inner world, of his inner world, uh, bringing it um, to the external um, world. I mean, in a kind of uh, new um, uh, dimension. And I felt, but maybe um, I didn't really get your um, uh, what you wanted to express, but uh, as if it was a thing in itself, as if the piece of work was a thing in itself. And my wondering is that what about uh, the effect on the spectators, on the audience? Because um, I was thinking about other artists um, uh, in a conference I saw um, last year, uh, artists who were becoming to, to uh, lose uh, their sight, they were becoming to be blind. And they started to create piece of works uh, to express uh, their distress and um, what they were feeling uh, about this loss of sight, which was a progressive loss of sight. And it was uh, incredible because there were picture photographs by photographers who are blind and they managed to convey the sense of losing sight, whereas I'm not blind um, and they are blind and they they managed to create um, the, the sensation. And what I get also in this um, expression um, of their inner self is that they wanted to uh, impress the spectator to convey a meaning. Um, does it make sense to you? Uh, um, according to what you said about something uh, uh, you want to express for yourself or as a thing in itself and about the relational uh, meaning of the piece of work. So shamanism is, uh, of course, a very problematic subject, isn't it? Um, because we can understand in, um, if you like, traditional society uh, um, um, that... Uh, um, the shaman um, performed a kind of transcendental, took a transcendental place. Um, I understand, and I think very beautifully, you talk about the blind, the blind artist. I think there's a wonderful film by Satyajit Ray, if I'm not wrong, about a, a blind artist. Um, um, and this sense that um, the visual is beyond the eyes, that the visual is in something else in us. Um, famously, of course, talking about shamanism, um, uh, the German artist Joseph Boyce, you know, spoke of himself as a shaman, made shamanistic um, um, performances that, that evoked the ancient animals of a, of a, of a tribal, bygone tribal period. Um, problematic from my perspective. I mean, um, um, the great thing about John Richardson and his uh, um, talk of Picasso's shamanism was, of course, that Picasso never claimed to be a shaman. What Picasso did was to look into the psyche and see the danger and allow Jung, if you like, to read it as, um, as uh, 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 evidence of schizophrenia. He, he did not see it as... Um, um, uh, so Picasso was, if you like, reaching into something that was shamanistic, if, you, if we use that word, in spite of himself. And I think 
there is something here about arts, poetry, literature's ability to, um, to reach these difficult, problematic, esoteric, transcendental uh, parts to ourselves. What they recognize is that we have those parts to ourselves. And I think that is the key question, is that so much of contemporary life, um, more than perhaps ever in our history, I feel it is our greatest danger, really, um, fails to recognize these, these um, 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 subtle beings that live within us. So who knows? <clears throat> Maybe by, by going again and again and again at the same subject, one can come, or the same questions, the same issues, the same problems, again and again and again, as you do in psychoanalysis, as we artists do on a daily basis. Maybe one can somehow, at some moment, say, oh, there it is. There's a little touch of something that I knew I knew and didn't know I know, and oh, where does it come from? and goes to the same thing that you understand, you, the viewer, understand, sight or no sight, if I may be so bold. <laughs> so I think it's really important that we make very, very high claims for what the psychic um, 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 insight, for what psychic insight can do that we don't say, oh, it's just a prosaic process. No, it's a prosaic process with extremely elevated possibilities, transcendental possibilities all the time. Mm -hmm. We mustn't underplay our deep psychic inner, inner world, fictional or not. Sorry, please. No, no, just, sorry, just, my yeah. question was also, um, uh, maybe it's a bit rough to say it like that, but do you expect people to understand you? Um, you know, the viewer brings what they bring. I, uh, once again, I'll say for the second time in this talk or third time in this talk, I have nothing to say. I don't want to say anything. Oh, gets in the way. Oh, you know, get out of the way, Anish. So the viewer will bring what they bring and they will understand or not understand. Um, and maybe there may be more value in not understanding, to go away and say, oh God, I didn't understand that. Now, I'm gonna put it in the context of something else, which is that other than what's up there in the universe, out there in the universe, beyond the world, beyond the, our globe, there is almost nothing we touch in life that is truly mysterious. There may be a very few, I mean very few, objects in art that remain mysterious. You look at them and you go, what the hell is that? And you continue with, what the hell is that? Um, and imagine, imagine that one might live a life to make something truly mysterious. What more do you want? more than enough for me. Just one thing, one thing that's truly profoundly mysterious where for the rest of time people go, what on earth is that? Wow, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe we could um, uh, let the floor uh, ask some questions. Ashish, uh, do you want to gather questions uh, by the floor? Please. please. Ashish, yeah, can I you also a few questions or so that we can converse with the floor? Yeah, I also wanted to ask them something, both of them, that uh, firstly, of course, the conversation has been deeply profound and stimulating as the responses of the audience are also pointing. Uh, but by looking at some of the essays written on your works, uh, Mr. Kapoor, uh, it seems like, and you've spoken about it today, uh, that uh, there is something about art being non-narcissistic, which is very important. And there's also 
something about the process of surrender uh, in the process of experiencing the art in the process of making it which you seem to be talking about i wanted to know that is there something eastern in this process of surrender in your observations or is it something which is which you feel is universal that's a tough one that's a tough one um hard to judge isn't it is it eastern is it not eastern is it i don't know where to cut where to go with that in a way um i think you know western art is also full of moments of uh if you like abandon if that's what you're talking mm-hmm. about um so um it runs in it runs in 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 all directions i mean i believe it to be um uh um as i've been trying to say a a, um, a realization or a a uh a um of human potential that's to say that what i know um do i dare to let go of what i know of our history of um of of recognition of palpability of um of taste um can i let them go really let them go and i can't do it willfully oh uh, yeah I, i can't do that willfully um but in the moment in the moment of making a work um you know sculpture is a weird process a long tedious boring uh, repetitive endless process to make an object takes time and yet what i do is i don't know if we've got a picture of this somewhere we probably don't but what i do is i draw all the time on the walls of my studio thousands of drawings and i just leave them there um they're mostly drawings of objects you know there'll be a little outline drawing of an object of some kind or another and it will um in a way i will see it through the corner of my eye hmm. different things and the decision to make an object i normally it's like that within 5 seconds so i'm going to make that or let's start that or whatever it is um without too much thought it doesn't mean it goes right it doesn't mean that it's not a waste of effort and energy and that's okay that's the point don't think do or as they say in zen first idea best idea go for it now and i think it's not dissimilar to psychoanalytical process in the sense that um the 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 um an analysant is lying there there's too much can i can't i can't i can't I? but go for it do it risk it let it come let it emerge and slowly its its language will form itself mm-hmm. um isn't that in a way um the root of i'm going to go backwards and say the root of shamanistic process that it's the daring to venture into what is only tangentially known all the mythic beings that mm-hmm. surround and in 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 involute us um um it's freud's you know it's freud's looking at the back of the cave into the darkness not plato's looking forward out from the cave into light it's the other way around and i feel mm. that is our predilection and that is if you like the beauty of our of 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 this time but it has to do with letting go if i look at the back of the cave oh god it's full of fear and horror and where it's going to smell and it's going to oh my god but do i dare to go there i'm going to risk it <laughs> and that is if you like the spiritual uh psychic um adventure that i allow myself as an artist that i insist on as an artist that i come back to every day and say if you're not doing that ah oh, don't waste your time just make another object what for the world's full of yeah. bloody objects who cares i have just uh, two small observations on that but exact uh, i don't think there is the eastern it's a part of it it is only what language we have come to speak because otherwise psychoanalysis i would call it uh, 
a very much a modern meditation which is a meditation is an eastern word but psychoanalysis is meditation for two people not a si- single meditation but two people a rational meditation so mm-hmm. those are kind of language one but the interesting part of the shamanic part is of uh, it tells us also that maybe our view of the what is the unconscious is uh, limited one or we limit it ourselves yes very much there's the dynamics freudian psychoanalytic unconscious but there is also perhaps uh, other unconsciouses cognitive unconscious we know but also a cultural unconscious and uh, what is called the transcendent to the spiritual uh, unconscious there and uh, which of course has lots of problems there because because that would say that uh, the brain is only a filter of our consciousness is not a process of brain processes but is brain is only a filter from which the transcendental consciousness comes and is transformed from through to social cultural cognitive brain processes into our personal individual consciousness but people and they, they would say mystics artists can connect to that or the shamans can connect to that the other spiritual transcendental consciousness at times and that is what their fascination is but that would of course uh, 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 have a, a difficult time in the modern scientific one where consciousness is defined by neuroscientists as only an epiphenomena of brain processes mm. okay we'll just take yeah. some question from the od- uh, from the audience they have been waiting patiently uh, yes. one of the questions is that the question of why artists are afraid of psychoanalysis is coming up today again and again Mm. i'm wondering if it turn the question around why psychoanalysts have extraordinary expectation from artists to be exceptionally open to psychoanalysis <laughs> i mean uh, one of the myths of uh, uh um artists is that i carry my wound artist carries his or her wound and that if i look too hard at my wound it may heal itself and then i won't know how to be an artist and it seems to me that that is a very 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 deep fear deep fear it is my wound that allows me to be the artist to to explore these parts of myself but if my wound heals up what will i do um and that uh, it seems to me to be a bit immature <laughs> a bit problematic but yes um um so what do psychoanalysts expect of artists oh god knows i don't know <laughs> what is psychoanalysts expect of artists <laughs> I, uh, i would have a provocative answer to that that it seems to me that having generally turned away from religion if psychoanalysts have a religion at all it is art the difference which going back to freud that psychoanalysis brings to art with artists as priests of this secular religion and museums as its temple is remarkable mm. for a psychoanalyst who comes from a non western culture which automatically also makes him an anthropologist of psychoanalysis this kind of difference in his culture is accorded only to the mystics more than the artists mm-hmm. Well said. Agreed. Yeah. But of course, the other side of that is that artists are perfectly ordinary people, for the most part. Perfectly ordinary people, and um, we do ordinary things and live ordinary lives at, at some level, anyway. Um, but then there is this practice, this thing that I insist is practice, again and again and again and again. um and the practice reveals the practice gives forth if we're lucky <laughs> um anyway well up can we move uh, with another question of the audience please uh, so um i'm uh, reading one of the questions uh here it is uh just thinking around the beginning of the buddha's heart sutra void is the shape shape is the void there is no void no shape and so on 
and the paradoxical concept of the whole. The whole is not the empty space inside, but is not the container which contains it. So it was a question by uh, an Italian analyst. Uh, we had a, as a panelist uh, formerly, previously, sorry, Alessandra Bruni. Um, but void, void. The Heart Sutra, of course, is one of the great um, um, insightful and continuingly mysterious prayers, which doesn't fully reveal itself. That what is, isn't, and what isn't is, and fullness, emptiness, that, that in other words, that while I am I, I am also not I. And um, this not I question that Buddhism keeps returning to is um, um, extremely profound and extremely mysterious. How can I be, how can training of any kind um, put me in a place where I am not me, where I, I am not? How can it be? Um, and yet that is the aim. Um, I, I've, I've done, you know, I've been in a, a Zen training group for many, many, many years. And our teacher used to say, give yourself up to what is being done at this moment. Whatever it is, give yourself. Give yourself away. And of course, we all experience that in our lives. You know, we're involved in something marvelously, whatever, engaging. And what do you know? Time goes like this. No time. Time didn't exist. I just gave myself to that thing and it, it engulfed me. There was no me. It just was. Um, giving oneself away, of course, is, is one way of speaking of no object, non-object. Um, it's, of course, a classical, um, perhaps even, dare I say, Lacanian return of, of uh, image, reflection, um, um, coming and going, reversal, upside downness. Um, so what is, is, is and what is, isn't simultaneously. Anyway, voila. I'm not going to say any more um, on this. Yeah. The next question mm -hmm. is uh, touching upon the first sense of the emotional moment you shared right at the beginning. Mm. The question is that, do you trace your fascination with the numinous or magical quality of artistic materials back to that Indian soil that was brought to help you to dream yourself well? The answer is yes. And I mean, can you imagine that? What a, what a gift to have soil from India under my bed while I was going through the most horrific crisis. Um, but I want to put it alongside something else. I mentioned the other ritual material as blood. My, I have a great marvelous friend um, who's, a, who's an anthropologist called Chris Knight. Chris Knight is rather, rather a radical anthropologist who wrote a, a beautiful book called Blood Relations. Um, in it, he talks about the origin of culture. Um, problematic subject, I understand. But he talks about uh, women um, um, and menstrual, menstrual cycle and how women, I'm paraphrasing terribly, but forgive me, otherwise it take too long. Um, so how women... Um, 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 living together, have synchronized uh, menstrual cycles, um, and that in so doing, they form um, 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 almost Marxist collegiate groups or group that, that denies sex at the same time to, to the men in the group. Um, and in order to mask their um, uh, menstruation, they cover themselves in the blood of the earth, which is red ochre. And this leads to the first acts of culture, which are dance or some such related event. Um, uh, in itself, a very beautiful, beautiful idea. Um, 
To me, what it does is to say that it transfers all objects of devotion to the earth. It says that they're all horizontal. Blood flows downwards and into the ground. They are horizontal. The gods, the gods thereby are all, if you like, earthbound. They bleed, they die, they regenerate. Men have no access to blood. We just don't. Only in art do we have, in art, in hunting, and in circumcision, it seems to me, do we have access to blood. So we struggle to, to find an equivalent. And what, I mean, uh, my projection on this, and it's not just mine, but uh, allow me this, um, is that the horizontality spoken of by blood ritual is turned into verticality by, um, by, by male uh, uh, takeover. The gods all go into the sky. They are all blue. They never die. And they sit in judgment. Huge, huge psychic shift, it seems to me. Um, so much so that Jesus has to remember his, his blood origin with a little wound. Where is it? A little wound in his side over there. Um, and we could say this of Indian gods all over the place. It's all over. There is a continual memory of blood origin. I think it's a rather beautiful theory, um, which speaks about um, primal Freudian, of course, Freud's uh, totem and taboo, primal sacrifice, and the, the, the origin, if you like, of father power, and so on, so on, so on. Um, uh, therefore, blood, blood clearly is the second um, um, ritual material. In an Indian context, one might say that milk, yogurt, milk, whatever, is the third one. But whatever, whatever. I do believe these are terribly important um, 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 uh, projections into material. What they do is turn material from, from, from um, the material stuff of the world from, uh, it's no longer material, it becomes psychic material. And so this alchemical something is going on, rubbing in there, and something's going on. Very profound, it seems to me. Mm, Anish, you were talking uh, previously of the abject uh, mm. a notion, um, a concept developed by uh, Julia Kristeva. Um, and I was thinking about that uh, since you mentioned the blood and uh, your piece of work. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you mentioned the piece of work, you know, with the uh, shooting uh, and the, all this blood. And it made me think about um, rather the menstruation of the woman. Uh, the blood um, could be also uh, the, um, the feminine, uh, the kind of um, animality, um, uh, something very, uh, um, well, could you develop uh, about the flesh also? Because uh, Julia Kristeva talks about the la chair des mots, which is uh, uh, the translation would be the flesh of the words and uh, the stronger bond to the flesh um, and the, bond, the blood and uh, uh, the sufferance. You talked about also about the sufferance, the, the artist that suffers. Um, Mm, mm, mm. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, yes. Oh my God. Okay, let's have a go. Um, first of all, as I've said, you know, Julia is um, um, Julia's writings uh, um, um, often sit in a very interesting area between um, um, art historical observation and um, 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 psych analytical of um, um, un, un, unwrapping um, 
and uh, it, it, it can often be very profound. She also writes very beautifully, I must say. Um, to blood, flesh, the abject, um, the sense, if you like, of that which we refuse um, and are still uh, eternally drawn to. Um, I think we know that when we die, we ourselves become abject. Somewhere there is a sense that we rot, we burn, we whatever it is, whatever it is that, that our cultural um, um, realities push to. And we end up um, struggling with how uh, the, 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 the abject can be transcendent. Can it be, is it transcendent? Is it um, is. Um, possible um, um, to, to, is it possible to, to um, hold um, onto both realities. So dear, I'm really interested in your view of this, dear, because you've written a great deal about it. Um, this is a subject which, which I know you hold very, very, very close. Please, dear, tell us. Oh, uh, I think in psychoanalysis, it's uh, exactly the point. We have to struggle with the abject, and that's yes. a, a very, uh, it's the core of the psychic work. Yes, it's not, I would it's agree not, with It's not being a conformist, because when you say uh, previously that uh, some artists would fear to go to analysis because they would lose uh, their inspiration, for instance, it's like a kind of stereotype that they would be a conform, conformist, uh, that psychoanalysis would uh, just put them in uh, the good uh, cases. Uh, yeah, that it normalizes. Yeah. Yes, but it's absolutely not yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, we deal uh, daily with the abject and uh, yeah. uh, this, uh, uh, the, mo the more painful parts of uh, the human psyche. So, um, and it's endless. So, I, I, I feel. Um, optimistic, or at least a very um, mm -hmm. uh, not let's uh, not say optimistic, but uh, we have to be um, brave and uh, still uh, go uh, day by day, and uh, as you said, go back and back um, in a kind of repetitive way, but. Um, Things can be figured out, um, and um, uh, maybe we, I could ask my colleagues also to answer, to share uh, Sudhir and Ashish, uh, if uh, I may ask. I think Dr. Kakkar is waiting to say something. So, yeah, Dr. Kakkar. Oh, I'm not ready to say. <laughs> I, I was still, I, my, my mind was still on the, on the blood earth part of it. There was, it was all going on. <laughs> So I can't just say to that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I uh, well, it's probably uh, I I have a I completely agree with the horror and the pain part of it. Uh, uh, but uh, to stop there, that is something which uh, uh, which I feel that that the pain and horror really opens up something. Uh, which both heals and creates in all it. So it is that that sun at the bottom of that horror and pain and the darkness. Uh, and, and, and psychoanalysis, or most psychoanalysts to stop at the pain and the horror, which, which is absolutely necessary to stay with it. Uh, but but that, is, uh, that is not the one which, you know, which through, for me, which through which psychoanalysis works, so also to heal. It only opens up something and which is this whatever you want to call it transcendental creativity etc. So that's why i use that word yes 
Yeah, yeah I don't know which word to use there. Mm-hmm. So to so horror, yes, but not to stop at the horror. Horror, horror is only that, that black there. When you go in, uh, you have to go go through that horror, but that is not the end of uh, what uh, psyche is all about. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, there's a very, very beautiful, um, I feel, forgive me for doing Julia again, but Julia Kristeva essay in her book, Black Sun, um, mm-hmm. in which she talks about uh, Hans Holbein's painting of the dead Christ, which is in the Kunstmuseum in Basel. Um, and in, in um, that uh, beautiful essay, she writes about the idea, um, Sudhir, to your point here, um, about how this painting, just to describe it, is uh, uh, 30 centimeters tall, so only that tall, and just the length of the body, almost like as if the body is in a sarcophagus, in uh, a, a in tomb. Um, um, so there's no space for anything. Uh, the painting has Christ with a face that looks like it's got wounds on it. Um, uh, the body's just sort of lying there. Um, and um, one hand is sticking out with, the, with of course, the, the stigmata there, the wound in his side, and he's got his finger like this. Of, of, on I, his right hand, facing. Have, there you go. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. There you go. There you go. Indeed. I don't know. If Indeed. It's... Yeah. And and um, the face. You know. So here is a dead man. A dead man. A man. Not transcendent. Just a man. A dead man. Lying there in corporal reality, as Julia says, having experienced the most horrific, torturous um, journey. And she says, she calculates that it took six hours to carry the cross, be whatever else, nailed up, whatever, 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 for the whole horror of it. So unshirking, this painting is unshirking in its depiction of horror. The next stage of this essay talks, at least if I've understood it correctly, talks about what that does. It has no message. It just presents the body. There's the body. It doesn't say, you know, believe, don't believe, doesn't, but the body. But what this does, I think, to the viewer is to evoke in them a sense of the transcendent. The transcendent isn't explicit in the work. It's mm-hmm. hidden in the experience of the viewer. And I think there's something deeply profound in that. It comes to my earlier point, repeated point about get out of the way, artist, get out of the way. Um, because what happens is that in this process of looking something truly transformative can take place if there is the space for it. <clears throat> it can also apply to psychoanalysts, get out of the way. Of course, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> this may be a very Eastern thing, by the way, get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not in today's India, but, you, but in, 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 in yeah. if you like, our long okay. history. <laughs> don't, don't fall so much in love with your interpretations. Yeah. <laughs> I think this would be a good time to uh, conclude this session. It's been uh, extremely stimulating and deeply profound to listen to both of you. And I think uh, the conversation could have definitely continued, but because of our time limits and uh, we would like to conclude and we are very thankful that both of you could join and create this rich discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you. Honored. Thank you.
to, the, to share with you, my dear Sadir, is yeah, really, yeah, truly yeah. an honor. Thank Come you so much. Again. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many uh, thanks. Thank you all. We uh, use this last uh, few minutes just to um, tell you about this message we are going to send to the next webinar. It is a sort of me of a message in a bottle, so in a an image and um, and uh, some words from this webinar that we wish to send to the next one, which is going to be on photography and painting. And it's going to happen in the next few minutes. So, so this is another Anish's artwork, Leviathan, the interior, this is wonderful. And uh, the, the words we chose were uh, the visual is beyond our eyes. So thank you so much. Thank you for thank this, you. this wonderful. And, and thank you for the last vision. Yeah. I'm looking forward to my dreams. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks bye a bye. Lot. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Sadir. Thanks, Sadir. Thank you.